So, why are we here today? No, it's not a free breakfast. It's a nice thing, but it's not it. There is a price for the free breakfast. Nothing is for free, you know that. So what we will do is we will try to cover a couple of topics related to heating and ventilation in industrial facilities. Um, I stress that now because from now on I will just be referring to heating and ventilation, but this is industrial facility. It has nothing to do fa with facility like this where ventilation is brought for our comfort of people. Industrial ventilation, industrial heating is brought much less for comfort of people and much more for a process and then as a comfort a secondary part. So there are some differences in how that uh, machine, uh, how the systems work and how the setups work. Uh, we'll cover a couple of topics. I'm not gonna go over them. Uh, we'll cover them as we go. But to start with, what I would like to do is just, uh, for those who have not attended this before, go over our program, how our program works. When we talk about industrial Enbridge DSM program or demand side management program, what it really is. Um, we've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, and the reason we've done it for so long and been so successful at it is because we adapt to the needs of our customers. We gain trust through working with you, and we're here for the long run. I mean, we're utility, we're not going anywhere, right? And we have to work with our customers only. We cannot go and poach, for example, Union Gas customer. So our, our customer base is fixed, and therefore we appreciate every one of you, and we work with you for years to come. What does it mean that we appreciate you and, and, and work with you for a while? It also means that we understand your needs. And I'm not saying that from the arrogant position. I'm not saying we know everything. We don't. But we are very honest with you. We tell you what we know, what we don't know. We tell you what we've seen, what we haven't seen. But most importantly, we understand you. Most of us came to this job from the industrial facility, from manufacturing facility. So we understand the pressures you guys are under. We need, we need to work with you to come up with a decision. What, what makes the project actually being implemented? What kind of business case you need? All of that, uh, uh, risks. It's easier just to leave everything running as is. When you change something, you undertake a certain amount of risk. We understand that, we try to alleviate that, we try to work with you. And all of it results and culminates in a business case. Uh, we put a lot of effort and emphasis on our incentives but ultimately, if I give you a business case and the payback is six months, your company's gonna do it anyways, whether there's incentive or not. The problem is identify those projects, finding those projects, build the business case so your management can say, oh yeah, here's the money because it makes sense. That's the part that's really important for us. And through that, we, we build what we call long-term partnership with you people and success. That's most important to us. Everything else is a secondary. So steps, how we do this, for those of you, good morning. For those of you who um, come from the manufacturing background and, and the quality, this will be very familiar. It's a plan, uh, do you check act uh, stuff. We start with the knowledge development, arm customers with information. Step one, workshops like this. Step two, we help you identify the opportunity. Where is it that you can save energy in the first place? How do we know how much energy is there? We support you through the measurement of those um, uh, thermal energy streams. We make sense of the data that we collected. Now you have a whole bunch of measured data. What do you do with it? What does make sense? What doesn't make sense? We are there with you to help you understand. And ultimately, it's action implementation. It's the stuff that you implement in your facility that makes a difference. Because without action and implementation, all the other steps prior to it are not gonna result in changes. So energy will be saved only through doing something. And doing something, unfortunately, falls on you because it's your facility. We cannot do that for you. But we can get you to the stage where when you do something, you know you're gonna result in, the, in success, which is much easier than to go, at, go at it alone. So for each one of these steps, there is a certain amount of um, either free services, for example, knowledge development from our, on our part, quarterly newsletter, web portal. We have a very nice web portal with some calculators for how to save energy with some uh, technologies. Um, materials on past successes, case studies. That's all free for you on our website. Opportunity identification. If we go and work with you through your facility, we identify opportunity, that of course is free to you. There is no, you don't pay for our service uh, through the check or anything like that. 
Um, if you feel that we are not uh, qualified enough, if you want somebody else to do the service for you, we cover up to 50% of the cost of such a service. Same goes with the measurement. It's easy for us to say we need to measure, but ultimately we all know that measuring natural gas is not as cheap or as simple as measuring electricity. Natural gas meters are more expensive. We understand that. We give you 50% of the cost of the natural gas installation, and we'll help you identify the cheapest method that is still satisfied, uh, satisfactory for the needs you need. So example is, um, if, you wanna, if you have three or four gas users, we'll find a way of measuring maybe only two gas users and we'll calculate the rest. You will still be within a couple of percentage points of accuracy of where the natural gas is with half the cost. Engineering analysis, again, if done by us, free to you, there is no, serv there is no uh, service fee for that. But if you need more uh, detailed, more involved analysis, for example, for your um, production processes, for something very specific to your process, we cover up to 50% of the cost of such analysis as well by a third party. Um, both of these third party offers, we do not recommend anybody. We find that you guys can find the best solution for yourself, but if you need us to give you some recommendation, we can give you three or four names that we worked with in the past. However, uh, the incentive applies regardless who the business partner is. And finally, if we do get to the stage where you implement the project, where you actually save gas, there is a financial incentive avail available based on annual cubic meter saved. Um, or if the project is very fast payback, we give you up to 50% of the project cost as it stands today. So along every step of this way, we actually have support for you, be it financial, be it through our services, be it through our uh, website. So you're not alone in it. Application process, um, for those of you who dealt with us before, you're familiar with this. For those of you who haven't, um, it doesn't get any easier. Uh, ESCs that were standing up will do actually application for you. They'll write up everything. They'll bring it to you. All you have to do is sign it. And I really do mean sign it. That's it. Um, everything else is done by us. So there is not, no work on your part. And of course, participating in all these programs, uh, people don't think of that often, but ultimately it reduces your CO2 emissions, and that's big nowadays. Everybody's talking about it, so this is going to get even bigger. And most important, in my mind, is improves your bottom line. Whatever improves your bottom line makes your facility more liable to stay here for as long as possible, and we all want that. This is what we've done so far, just in case um, there's questions on, you know, it's easy to talk, but what have you done? Well, we saved 110 million cubic meters of natural gas, over 20 million kilowatt hours of electricity, over 800,000 cubic meters of water to our customers in only three year period. I mean, these are significant savings, guys. They, this is not something that we take lightly. We are audited by internal and external parties. So when we give you an estimate on the savings, you can count on it that it's pretty accurate or as accurate as assumptions that we build into our and all the assumptions are confirmed by you. We don't do assumptions on our own. So this is not us doing some calculation in some office somewhere in the corner. We actually come to you, we explain to you how we've done calculation, what assumption we've taken. We work with you to actually get that done properly. So once we give you a business case and say, you're gonna save this much, you're gonna be saving pretty much what we said that you are. Okay, now after this free commercial, let's get to the meat of it. Heating and ventilation in industrial facilities. We said that we're gonna talk about industrial facilities, so this is one such facility, let's take a look at it. So when we talk of heating and ventilation, we have great diversity of applications. It's not like one industrial facility looks like every other one. That's not the case at all. There's many different ways, many different makeup air units, direct, direct fired, steam, coil, indirect heated, whole bunch of them. There's the space heaters, unit heaters, you know, those little boxes that sit on the tops of the corners of the units. There's IR heaters that usually sit on top of your shipping docks. Those are the things that are different from, utility, uh, from this, uh, facility to facility. There is no one that looks exactly like the other one. And then we have control strategies that control all these units. 
they're drastically different. You wouldn't believe how different the systems are between your facilities. We have some centralized systems. We have what we call the, um, demand control ventilation. The, you, some of you have building automation systems. Um, they're not very common uh, yet, actually, but they are there. And then we have a bunch of units that have individually controlled each unit. So they will have five or six makeup air units, 50 space heaters, 75 exhaust fans, and they're all individually controlled. I mean, it's a mess. So when you look at all of that, you're like, well, how can we talk about heating and ventilation industrial facility in one sitting then? But when you really reduce it down to the basics, industrial heating and ventilation does overcome building envelope losses. So those, that's the stuff. If, you did, if your building has less insulation, the more losses are occurring. Therefore, you need to make up that energy. So that's one of the uh, elements that heating and ventilation has to take care of. The other one is to provide adequate exhaust. And this is very important in industrial facilities for indoor air quality. We do welding, we do stamping, we do painting, we do all sorts of stuff in our facilities. All of those activities require certain element of exhaust to maintain indoor air quality. And of course, once we exhaust, now we have to heat outdoor air to make it up. So now we have that third function of the heating and ventilation, which is heating of the outdoor air. So beyond all the house uh, details, from the basic standpoint, from the solid engineering side, these are the three functions that heating and ventilation system must provide in every one of our facilities. So we approach that from that perspective. Rather than worrying about individual control and getting down to the nitty gritty of it, we want to look at it from the basic point. Because then once you know what you're doing, then you can easier control whichever strategy you uh, try to implement. The question is, and the biggest problem in the facility is finding the right balance. We talked about building has uh, exhaust and building has make up air, but finding the right balance between the two of them is really difficult. So if you have too much of either mechanically supplied make up air or mechanically extracted air or exhaust, we talk about facility being either under negative or positive pressure. So that's the basis. And most of our facilities in our service area that I've seen, um, feel free to uh, chime in, are usually negative air pressure in industrial facilities. So what we want to do today is give you an understanding that impact that negative air pressure has on your operation, on your cost, and on your productivity. And hopefully by the, uh, by the time this session is over, you will get a grasp of it, and I'll be able to transmit that understanding how that impacts. Notice that I'm not talking about energy here. <clears throat> energy is secondary. You live for the manufacturer. You live for shipping the product. To do that at good quality, at good cost, you have to control cost, and you have to control productivity rates. And believe it or not, heating and ventilation has impact on both, not just on energy. So let's define what, when, when I talk about the negative air pressure, what is it that I'm talking about? So imagine an empty juice box, right? The, the stuff that kids take to the baseball, you know, the tetra pack thing. <clears throat> what happens if you suck the air out of it? You put the, you know, straw and you suck the air out of it. You create negative pressure, it collapses, right? That's negative pressure. That's essentially what happens in our buildings when we have too much exhaust. So when we talk about negative air pressure, this is what we talk about. Yeah, true, the facilities will not collapse. That's not gonna happen um, because they're not airtight. None of our facilities are very airtight, so they can collapse. But even if they were, the fans that exhaust that air are not strong enough to actually collapse the walls. But it doesn't mean that everything's okay. There's, uh, removing those large quantities of air has actual impact and consequences. And that's what we want to talk about today. What kind of impact and consequences that has. So, first of all, it leads to uncomfortable and cold environments. <coughs> and this is where the lost productivity comes. And we'll touch upon that a little bit later. Secondly, of course, it increases the energy consumption. But energy consumption in both electricity and natural gas then lowers down your, uh, increases your cost. 
and lowers down your uh, margins. That's very important part. So both productivity and costs are affected. So let's talk about the um, cost aspect first because it's easier to grasp. So everybody says, well, you know, we have negative air pressure. Everybody knows about it. So when they designed the building, they must have thought of that. They must have avoided that somehow already. Yes, there is a way to avoid that. If you have a building and you have lots of exhaust volume, what designers of the building, in, when they originally set up the building, what they do is they put something called makeup air. We all know that. Now we know why it's called makeup air, because it's making up the air that is exhausted out of the space. So that makeup air um, units, they bring the fresh air, they temper it a little bit so it's not cold, and bring it to replace the exhaust volume. And we talked about it, it needs to be balanced, okay? So the proper system design, proper balancing of the two is very important. And what drives the exhaust volume in our facilities? Number one reason why we have the exhaust as much as we have, by design, is process <coughs> requirement. So if you have an oven that has to exhaust, say, 3,000 CFM, you have to bring 3,000 CFM, cubic feet per minute of air, back into the building. So when the building is designed from scratch, when they put all the equipment together, they say, this is how much we're going to exhaust. We need a little bit extra. And that's how they put um, makeup air volume in place. So that's what makeup air does. And then additionally, if you have makeup air with the direct fired system that spews essentially the, the products of combustion into the space, you need to ensure that your exhaust is tied into the makeup air to, to ensure that that co product of combustion will actually get drawn out of the building on time and you're not going to affect indoor air quality in a negative way. So those are the, the design parameters. That's what they're supposed to do when design the building. But unfortunately, how many buildings have you worked in that was designed from scratch for your purpose? Not very many. And those that have been, have been designed 50 years ago. We've changed 17 times our processes. We refigured machines. We moved them around. Very few people actually then go back and look whether their building is properly designed for the purpose that we have in today. But this is what I want you to remember that, you know, it's not actually exhaust that consumes energy. It's the makeup air. But makeup air is there only to make up the exhaust. Therefore, the controlling energy consumption associated with the makeup air will control your cost. But the number or volume of makeup air is controlled by the exhaust. So you can draw the straight line and say, actually, controlling my exhaust controls my cost. So first one, we have an example here that I would like to work through to the new work activity workbook. Uh, just to give you an, uh, a feel for how much this makeup air costing us, let's do a quick example. Let's say that we have a system that has 40,000 CFM of makeup air volume. Average temperature in Toronto for heating season 38.4 degrees F. Let's say you want to heat it to 70 degrees temperature. Let's say you have fan static pressure of half inch water column and that you're operating for 6,048 hours a year. So that's in your uh, workbook on uh, uh, the beginning. Uh, that's about five days a week, 24 hours a day, um, and 48 weeks. These are the formulas that we will use. First formula is how much natural gas is used in the makeup air unit. And the Q, the energy of the makeup air unit formula is down below. So essentially, it's 1.08 times the volume of air that goes through the unit times delta temperature divided by the efficiency of the unit. And efficiency of the unit for direct fire makeup air is usually 91%. So if you quickly do the uh, uh, math in your workbook, I'll give you a couple of minutes. Let's see what number you come up with. So before we go on to the answers, <clears throat> I'd just like to point out one thing. Remember we talked about 6,000 hours for heating season? So when we use natural gas, it was 6,048 hours. But when you calculate electricity, we're talking 8,400 hours or whatever your facility operates because 
makeup air is required even when it's not heated. So electricity, when you calculate cost of makeup air for electricity, always remember it goes for whole year, not just for the heating season. So let's see what the results were. I mean, sooner or later we'll all figure this out. It's not difficult to calculate, but what I really want to impact here is not so much calculation process because it's very simple, but what I want to do is look at the cost. Total cost is $67,000 for this 40,000 cubic feet per minute. 40,000 cubic feet per minute is not a huge makeup air unit, but the cost is significant. And how significant? Let's assume we have a facility that has annual revenue of about $1.8 million, 150,000 widgets are produced in this facility, therefore your revenue per widget is about $12. I pulled some just random, this is not any one facility, this is a random facility, but the cost structure is very similar to the facility I used to work at in automotive supply. 60% of cost was in raw materials, 25% in labor, 11% equipment miscellaneous, 3.5% energy cost. So the total cost $1.65 million. So if you do net profit margin calculation real quick, you take the revenue minus cost divided by the revenue turned into the percentage, you get something like 9.6%. So this imaginary facility has 9.6% net profit margin, which means the profit for every widget out of those $12 revenue, the profit is $1.17 for every widget. Let's say we can save $16,000. So out of this $66,000, so let's say we had 40,000 CFM makeup air unit, we can shave down $16,000 in cost. It's not big change. But we increased our net profit margin by 1% which means now each one of our widgets makes us almost 10 cents more. I can tell you from our example, we could not cut material cost or labor cost to have that impact. And every time you cut labor, you get quality problems associated with those that stay. Every time you cut raw material cost, you have the quality problems with the supplier because that's only so much they can give you for the cost that they offer. On the contrary, 1% cut in energy use is a feel-good measure. Nobody will be like, oh my God, we cut cost. They won't even know. And yet you increase your profit per widget by 10 cents. Nothing matches that, nothing. That's why it's important to remember that impact that energy costs have. Don't look at it only as a tiny little pro, uh, cost per percentage, because it is, but the impact it makes is huge. So what I really want you to take away with today is this. Each thousand CFM will cost you about $1,700 at current prices. Most of you will actually pay slightly more than 12 cents per kilowatt hour, but that's fine. That's no big deal, one way or the other. That's the cost of it. And one medium-sized mushroom fan on top of your facility takes about 5,000 CFM out. Only one. So we have to remember this. That volume of makeup air that we're introducing into the building at $1,680 every thousand CFM is controlled by your exhaust. So controlling your exhaust will control that cost directly. So now we talked about energy cost and consumption and all that good stuff. Let's go back to the other uh, subject, which was uncomfortable cold environment which results in the lost productivity. So how does that happen? Let's think about it a little bit. If we have 100 volumes of, uh, 100 units of exhaust volume going out of the building, and we only make up 25 units in makeup air, the difference, the 75 units that have to come from somewhere, guess where they will come from? Exactly from the outdoors at outdoor temperatures too, to boot. So when it's really cold outside, three units of air in your facility for every one unit that's heated. Guess what that facility will feel like? It's cold, right? 
So what, what can we do to heat that infiltration air? What, what heats that infiltration air now? So it's not makeup air because makeup air is only heating whatever goes through the makeup air unit. So you can argue that eventually if, if you put enough makeup air over a period of time, it will mix and it will create that um, warm environment, but that's not exactly how it happens. So you have the space heating. That's the only element that actually heats the infiltration air. And what's the space heating? What, what are space heating units for? Usually, they're located around the perimeter, something like this, or near the shipping door area. Be and the way they're designed is to offset the building envelope losses. That's why they're usually around the perimeter of the building. That's all they're designed to do. And the envelope losses in industrial building are dwarfed by the infiltration and the exhaust volumes. So you have these tiny units sitting on the perimeter, and you're hoping that they will heat up the air. But when you look at the design intent of space heating units, that's all they're meant to do. Heat transfer through the walls, windows, doors, heat transfer through the roof, and essentially they're there to prevent your pipes from freezing. So when you shut off the facility for the weekend, nobody's there, you can turn on the space heating, nothing will freeze. It'll keep about 10 degrees Celsius. That's what they're meant to do. That's their design intent. They also provide localized and spot heating. So when somebody is freezing near the shipping doors and the guy goes and sells you uh, infrared heating, what do you do? You put the tube of infrared <coughs> on top of the guy and everybody's happy for a little while. Or they move very small amount. They, each one of those space heaters units usually has a small fan that moves about two and a half thousand CFM through the unit and heats it up. But that air doesn't reach to the other side of the system. It's very localized and it's small amount. So in, all in all, when you think about it, these units are not meant to offset large amounts of infiltration air and heat it up from the cold outdoor temperature to your 70 degree setting. That's not what they're meant to do. They don't have time for it and they don't have energy for it. So what really happens when you have a large exhaust volumes and the small makeup air volume, your infiltration air is leaving the facility pretty much at the same temperature it enters. Because you have, when you have large exhaust volumes, you have about between six and 10 air changes every hour. There is no way if you have 10 changes every hour in your you know, 3 million cubic foot facility that space heaters do anything to that air to warm it up. So when people complain about cold and drafty environment, this is where it comes from. So when the guy at the shipping door complains that he gets a lot of cold, drafty air, and you put infrared tube, you solve the problem for that one guy. But the guy standing 20 feet further is still freezing. Right? Yeah, good idea. <laughs> Can we try to explain that to your union guys? <laughs> uh, so that's really what happens. And that's what we have to solve. That's the root cause of our problem. Simple method for checking your own. We, if you don't believe me, go back to your facility when you have time and sit down and take a look at this methodology. Check what your exhaust volume is. If you don't have air balance with the name plates, just check it from the air plate. Sum it all up, that's gonna give you how much exhaust you have in CFM. Check how many hours your heating is on. And overall, heating system efficiency. If you don't any better, use 80%. That's a good enough number. Calculate this. And that will give you, you know, your exhaust energy. That, you, that it should be going out the stack if you're at 70 degrees F, or whatever your set point is. If your set point is 73 degrees F, it should leave at 72 degrees F. If it's 68, it should leave at 68 degrees F. But that's the energy amount in the exhaust that goes up the stack. Now take a look at your seasonal natural gas consumption. How much you actually pay for that heating. And in eight cases out of 10, your facility will actually exhaust more energy than you're paying for. And I, being from utility, can tell you that, that we, never, we would never allow that. So you pay what you use for sure. And if your usage shows to be higher than what you pay for, I can guarantee you that that exhaust is not leaving at 70 degrees F. It's leaving cold. Here's another methodology to do the same thing slightly simpler. 
you have facility, you have some source of heat. Because it's warm there, the guy there next to the oven is enjoying his life. I, I was in a facility, we had 12 uh, heat reading ovens. I can tell you that the guys next to the heat reading ovens never had anything but shorts, even in the middle of the winter in Milton. Now onto the natural gas part. Same thing goes for natural gas as we did for electricity. Some part of natural gas usage that goes into the process will be radiated inside the building. Some of it will go outside of it. In this case, what goes outside is the process exhaust loss. And if you don't know exactly what your process exhaust losses for your ovens are, you can easily use 45%. But 45% of your input into the, any sort of oven, natural gas powered oven, goes up the stack. There are some heater exhaust losses there as well because we take the air, we exhaust it out because it's a um, direct fire infrared heater. And because we have no fa forced part cooling, we'll just say that the rest of this, as the parts go onto this conveyor, they actually heat the space. If you have forced part cooling, if you have cooling tunnels, then situation gets a little more complicated. For this example, we have no case with the forced cooling. So we'll repeat the exercise. We'll take total load, 105 cubic meters. Remember, this is your process load. This is not your total consumption in the facility. You take 44 cubic meters off because that's process exhaust losses. You subtract further heater exhaust losses. And you get to about 56 cubic meters contributing to the internal heat gain. Much like for the other example with electricity, now we're going to get to the meat of it. We'll calculate how much energy in the internal heat gain that is. So these are the numbers. Now, a couple of things about these numbers that I would like to bring to your attention is 4 million BTUs per hour. Space heating unit, you know those space heaters, small ones with a little fan? Typical size, 250,000 BTUs. This is like 18 of them. And this is not a large consumption either in electricity nor in natural gas. And you generated eight equivalent of 18 space heaters of heat. That's how we should look at it. And that all came, as I said, small, small, relatively small industrial facility. 1,000 kilowatts is not a big number. Neither is 105 cubic meters per hour in process. So this methodology of in, uh, doing the internal heat gain calculation, I'm not going to claim it's 100% accurate, but it's very, very close approximation. And if you want it to be close, you just have to be careful how you pick how much of kilowatt hour load that you pay for goes inside the space you are um, analyzing and how much stays outside. If you get that right, calculation will, get, will not get you too far off the truth. So when they do it for the buildings, for design, for the commercial type buildings, for this kind of building, they calculate internal heat gain, but they say this is how many computers we're going to have roughly load on the computer is this percentage, and they calculate this fancy formula. I instead always ask customers to give us their average kilowatt demand, because that's what you pay for. That's what it is. I don't have to guess how much percentage you use. That's what you use. So that's how we assess internal heat gain. Now that we know what it is, how we use it. What do we do with it? Right? So if we think of the, our space as being heated slightly with space heating, then with some makeup air, that gets us to whatever we pay in our seasonal load. That's the metered seasonal load usage. We can tell you that for your facility, this is relatively easy to calculate. Now, if your internal heat gain that we just calculated added to the seasonal load exceeds whatever your exhausted air is, you essentially have too much heat in your facility, which is a good thing. Space feels hot, even in the wintertime, everywhere, not just locally. Doors are usually always kept propped open. I know that in our facility where I used to work, the doors next to the ovens were always open. And even when it was snowing, we had a little pile of snow inside the facility because they would never close the doors. They were warm. 
that is a sign that you have opportunity to reduce the heating energy. On the other hand, if your internal heat gain added to your metered seasonal load does not reach the level of exhausted air energy, if you're a little bit under, that's a good sign that you have drafty environment, that space has hot and cold spots all over the place, and that's the opportunity to reduce exhaust volume potential. So that's how we use this to gauge where you're at on that scale. Either case, the good news is that either case leads to potential energy savings. In either case, we can save energy. If we have this case where internal heat gain adds to the heat so much that we actually have too much heat, we can lower the makeup air temperature set points, we can lower the heating temperature set points, or we can redistribute the heat. Because you have to remember, a lot of places that I've seen, a lot of places that I worked at, makeup air temperature was set with the sensor up at the makeup air unit, not down at the, at the space because they didn't want anybody to play around with it, so they put the sensor up there. But what that does is make a pair constantly gives the temperature, regardless of what the temperature is in the space. So if you have too much heat from the other sources, make up air doesn't know that. It just keeps pumping the air. If you have more sophisticated system, then of course you're already doing that in a way. But redistributing the heat is an interesting part. Wouldn't it be nice if we can take the heat from this oven that radiates and that everybody is in shorts around and put it where people are freezing, near the shipping door? Wouldn't that work? Well, one of our customers actually did this just recently. So they had the shipping door, huge infiltration of air, and at 3.8 degrees Celsius, which is our average uh, winter temperature here, and then they have a source of heat. They had a bunch of injection molding machines on the other side of the building that were going 24-7. So of course, those are injection molding machines create a lot of heat. So what do they do to get rid of the heat? They put a bunch of exhaust on top of it. They were exhausting 88,000 CFM on average temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Average temperature in the rest of the space, 9 degrees Celsius in the winter. So what did we do in the end? We minimized this exhaust, and we took the rest of the exhaust, put socks on it, and forced that heat to the other side of the building. These, these socks were about 80 feet long. Total of four socks, 60,000 CFM in total of air being transferred from one side of the facility to the other. And notice how what happened here is most of the air was forced to the end, so it comes down on top of the shipping area. As a result, they reduced the infiltration to the point where last winter, they went through the whole winter without ever turning on the heating. They actually had heating units locked out. And they had 18 to 20 degrees Celsius average temperature inside the space. And the new plant manager who came this year on board said he's never had a facility where people told him that they were very comfortable inside the facility all winter long. I'll get back to this example in, in a minute, but let's just summarize what they did. Because this is the real example. This is what has been accomplished. Total invent, investment with the uh, air balance audit, design of the system, installation of the system was $44,000. They saved 255,000 cubic meters of natural gas, and they saved no electricity because instead of exhausting through the, out, uh, to, through the roof, we just pushed the air, we used fans to push the air through the facility. So electricity was a wash. They still saved $76,000. Their payback was half a year. And then we gave them half of the investment too. We gave them $20,000 and an incentive. Payback is before our incentive. Wow. Wow. Again, going back to my original point, if I want you to do the project only because of an incentive, look at it carefully. I want you to do this project because your payback is already six months. Incentive is nice. Yes, we'll give you incentive. You should get it. But that shouldn't be the driver. The driver should be $76,000 annual savings and the comfort of people. 
what they've done wrong, lessons learned for those who want to do this, is they locked out the exhaust, they replaced the plant manager who knew what to do, and they never started the exhaust in the summertime. So they were a little hot in the summertime <laughs> for about two weeks until they realized what the hell's going on, and then they turned on the exhaust back on. So the point is you want to distribute this heat inside the winter months and turn it back on those exhausts in the summertime. So that's a real example of distribution of the internal heat gain, how it can help you. On the other hand, we said the other example is when the internal heat gain added to your seasonal load doesn't reach the exhausted air energy, the area where you have drafty, cold environment. So what you can do for that is you can maximize the internal heat gain by recovering more of your waste heat. You can lower the general roof exhaust volumes. And you can interlock the process exhaust to the actual machines that need it. And we'll give you examples of these as well. So when we talk about maximizing internal heat gain, number one opportunity for most facilities is in air compressor heat recovery. Uh, some of you have done it already. Some of you have not. But this is the number one opportunity to recover waste heat in a proper way. Why? Because air compressors are inherently inefficient, massively inefficient. 80 to 93% of the energy input into the compressor is converted into waste heat. Compressor only needs 7% of energy to actually squeeze the air, but to get to that action, it has to generate about 90% heat. Most people don't realize that. And what's worse is most air compressors are usually put in the room on the side, as we talked before. Because they need a cold air, you usually have a little room that has louvers here that draws the outside air as much as possible. And then, because it gets really hot in the small room, they exhaust the heat off it up the, up the roof. So you don't even recover the waste heat that these compressors generate. So how can we recover some of the heat? Some of the examples for water-cooled systems, if you have water-cooled uh, air compressor, you can use it to preheat the process water. So if you have some need for the process water, you can use for that. You can use glycol loop to the makeup air unit. If you have makeup air units ever close by, you put a glycol loop, you heat the glycol on one side with the waste heat, and you run it just before the burner. So the burner gets not outdoor air, but the outdoor air already tempered. So the burner energy will go down in the makeup air unit. For air-cooled systems, it's even more uh, advantageous because all you need to do is make a big hole in the wall between the two units. And in the wintertime, dug the, instead of exhaust dumping out, dump it over here. What that does, it keeps the, this 90% of the energy inside the building um, and it reduces the need for your space heating. Again, about 80 to 90% of that heat energy will stay in your building. This is another part that we constantly battle. It's free. Everybody says, well, you know, what do I care how much internal heat gain I have? It's all free anyways. No, no, it's not free. You paid for that heat. You just don't realize maybe. So, because you paid for it, you have to maximize the benefit to get the most out of it. So, for example, in this air compressor example, let's say it did 150 kilowatt demand on the compressor, let's just say it. And let's say it runs 24, 5, 48 weeks a year at 12 cents a kilowatt hour. 120 kilowatts out of 150 is turned into heat that you just dump off out of the roof. That costs you $82,000 a year. Remember our example before where $16,000 made a difference in 10 cents per widget? This is $80,000 that you would now offset in your heating bill. And typical application is for very sophisticated air uh, compressor heat recovery is uh, maybe $15,000. For very simple is three, dollars $4,000. So for really simple, you just need a duct and dump it into the facility. But I've seen people who actually put duct, then they put the damper that's temperature controlled, and based on outdoor temperature, damper either goes and exhausts the uh, heat outside or inside the building. So that's a significant impact with very little effort. 
to get a feel for your own air compressors. We have on our portal at this web address, and this is going to be on our website as well. We have an air compressor heat recovery calculator. You put in how much horsepower you have, what kind of operation you run with it, what you estimate the load is, and it will tell you how much heat is available to recover, and it will also tell you how much that heat is worth it. One thing to, I always tell people that I deal with is logging is required, yes. We want to know who is uh, logging in for our own benefit. But it's free, and there's no obligations. Nobody's going to call you next week just because you logged in. So no, no fretting over that. It's up to you to say, uh, to do what you need to do there. Having said that, I always like to point out to our energy solution consultants, because they will know more than the calculator online. But this is a good first cut, just so you have a feel for how much it is. And then talk to energy solution consultant who will help you maximize the benefit. So going back to our story, um, to increase the space temperature, when they are cold, facilities usually try to do this, maximizing the heat gain. They usually try to do some of it. But usually what happens is your internal heat gain represents your losses. Air compressor is a good example where you can't do anything about it, so you might as well use it. That's why I use that example. But try to reduce the losses first. That's really important. Because even that internal heat gain, I mean, what, what do you do with it? You, you're essentially taking the light bulb to heat your space. And we all know that's not the most efficient way to heat the space, right? So let's not use internal heat gain just because we have it. Use it because that's the only solution that we have available to us. But not, don't go to it as a first step. First step should always be reduce your losses, then heat the space properly. The other thing that people do is reduce the infiltration path. They usually put something like a dock seal on the shipping door. They put the air curtains, all those good things. Those help. But the effect of them is limited as long as your facility is negative air pressure or large positive air pressure. It's the same thing. Because the, the effect that those measures have will be drastically reduced. Because they're not meant to prevent negative air. They're meant to deal with the, ne with the po uh, properly balanced building and then close off the infiltration path. So. Age-old question, apply Band-Aid solution or just go to the root problem? And usually we go to the Band-Aid solution because it's easier and it's the only thing we can do under the circumstances. I've done it many times. So. Um, but if we really want to resolve our problems, what we really should look at is reducing the exhaust in the building. That's the most important part. That's the step that you can gain something out of. And most facilities are reluctant to consider it because exhaust volumes are seen as required for indoor air quality. Exhaust and the indoor air quality, those are the two things that we hear often. Um, many times when we go into the facility, they cannot do anything with the exhaust because, oh my god, indoor air quality is going to go to dumps and we'll all die in here. So before we continue on, full disclosure, I'm not an indoor air quality expert. None of us are. We don't claim to be. Um, but I worked with a fair number of them. We don't uh, suggest customers do any of this. If there is any concern about indoor air quality without doing the indoor, indoor air quality um, study. They're usually very inexpensive. We, like everything else, give you 50% of the cost for doing one. And if that's um, important and that needs to be checked before the exhaust volume can be changed, we fully support that and we actually recommend it. It's not necessary all the time. But when it is, and when it makes people more likely to buy into the concept, it's a money well spent. Because <coughs> you have to remember that even if there is no indoor air quality issues, if one person complains about indoor air quality, you will have to go back and reset the exhaust. Because <coughs> you will not, I guarantee you, you will not take the risk on yourself to say that everything is OK without that indoor air quality. So, it's important, if that's an important part of selling the feature of exhaust, what we can do, help you out, is build a business case and say, hey, potential for savings is $100,000 a year. Is that worth $2,000 indoor air quality study? Yes, by all means. So let's do it. And then you have no problem once you turn down the exhaust. Um, 
But having said that, there is a lot of perceptions about indoor air quality. Not problems, perceptions. And perceptions usually are created, if, if your facility is anything like the ones that I worked in, in the summertime. Because that's when it really heats, is, is concentrated in the area, that's when it's really hot. And when it's hot, that's when you have all sorts of perceived issues with the smell, with odor, with the fumes, all sorts of stuff. The other thing that can happen that builds wrong perceptions is, in our, for example, we had hot coils. We did the coils for the cars. We did the, uh, when you roll the coil, when you make the coil, you do it with a uh, red hot steel. You roll the coil, you put it in the quench oil. And as soon as you put in the quench oil, guess what happens? There's a whole bunch of fume comes out of the quench oil tank, right? So what we did is we had a, um, almost like a hood above it that was supposed to draw out the fumes. But over time, we increased the production. Nobody ever increased the exhaust levels at that space. So what happened is some of the fume was sucked into the hood. Some of it was on the side. That was a big issue. We were a unionized facility. Uh, people walked out of the space, uh, out of work. It was all big hoopla. But what we've done, the only thing we've done to change that, we went back and redesigned the hood. So instead of two inch opening on the hood, we reduced it to one inch. So the same amount of exhaust was now going at a higher velocity. It was sucking all the fume. It was done. It was $500 fix. And it didn't affect any indoor air quality. So lots of times you deal with perceptions and things that can be fixed much easier than spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on the exhaust in the facility. And this always holds true. And if that my mind is hardest thing to change. We are all adults. People we deal with are adults. It's not kindergarten. They will not change who they are. So if it helps to do the study to make their mind change and to make them easier to, to buy into the system, well worth the money. So as I said, best counter with facts. But when we talk about indoor air quality before everybody gets upset over it, this is what our line of thought should always be. When the building was originally designed, the original exhaust volume was designed for that process. Unless your process changed drastically, the original amount of exhaust was um, balanced with the appropriate makeup air. That's how it started way back when. So as the, as the people's complaints were in the summertime, it's really hot in here. I can't stand it. So the plant manager goes, well, I can either fight this fight or I can just put another mushroom fan on top of the roof. I'm going to put a mushroom fan on top of the roof, get it over with. So we, over time, add these exhausts that nobody goes back because they're individually controlled. Nobody goes back and turns them off in the wintertime. When, I mean, I was in maintenance. I was in engineering. I was in production. None of those f functions ever went onto the roof to actually turn them off on the Friday afternoon or in the seasons. That was just not done. Too much work. So exhausts are added. And now our facility runs with way too much exhaust and way too little makeup air. So first thing to check if, if you want to do something like this is to take a look and say how much exhaust I have and how much makeup air I have. If that's very unbalanced, then you can go and question how did it become so imbalanced? Why? And you will find typically for those who are there for a long period of time, it's like, oh, we added this exhaust because there was a fume there. We added this exhaust because this guy was hot. There's reasons why we've done this, but people usually forget historical reasons, and now all of a sudden, that's the way it's supposed to run. And as a test, if, if the, you're looking at the lowered exhaust volumes, it's very easy to test. So you, do, you get a guy in to do perform uh, indoor air quality audit. You temporarily lock out the exhaust you're planning to, ex to lock out on a permanent basis. And you do follow-up indoor air quality audit, and you see if there's any changes. Nine cases out of 10 won't be any changes at all. So if that's positive, if there is no changes and there is no negative impact to the employee's health and safety, just implement control strategy now instead of temporarily locking them out. It's a very simple process. It's a very simple steps to take for potentially great gain. So now that we know that it's a good thing to turn down exhaust if we can, we know that we're not going to poison everybody, what can we actually do to control these exhaust volumes? What are some of the strategies? So first thing first, as Jim pointed out, turn exhaust fans off during the winter months. Most likely, most of your 
general exhaust runs because of the summer's conditions, turn them off in the winter time. Use localized exhaust reduction, extraction. So what happens is usually you have people who have process in one corner of the plant, and then they, instead of having a hood <laughs> above that process, they just have a lot of general exhaust fans that draw the air. But what happens is now you're drawing the fumes, you're dragging them right through the facility before it gets out. Put the hood, you're gonna reduce the exhaust. Speaking of example of perception and the hood exhaust, I was in one facility where they had, they used glue to glue two parts together. And in the old times, we had solvent in the glue. So what they did is they put 3,000 CFM fan and the hood right where the, where the gluing station is. Three years ago, they phased out the solvent out of there. And ever since then, they tried to turn off the exhaust. Every time they would turn off the exhaust, people would complain and would stop working because, oh my God, I can smell the glue. <laughs> So what we did, in the end, we paid for the indoor air quality audit that just checked that exhaust, so it was like $200, I believe, or something like that. We checked the exhaust, we found no solvent, and instead of turning off the exhaust, because that would upset the operators, we took the exhaust, instead of going through the roof, we just dumped it closer to the shipping area. So now, instead of losing 3,000 CFM of hot air, we just dumped it into the shipping area, and we used that heat. And because we did indoor air quality on that exhaust, we knew there was nothing dangerous in it. Shut down the exhaust during the breaks is another thing we can do. If you have process exhaust, and people can have hundreds of thousands of CFM of process exhaust, if you have breaks, you can program those exhausts to turn off during the breaks, because there's no, but no, no um, source of fumes at that time. You can interlock exhaust to make up air, and then shut down both during those non-productive times. Because you have to remember, makeup air is not there to make people comfortable. Makeup air is to make up the exhaust volume that's extracted. So if you don't have exhaust, you don't need makeup air. And of course, this is one thing that we often forget in our rush, adjust the capacity to meet new needs. Had a customer, very large customer, did a walkthrough of the facility with them, stood in one side of the building, looked up in the ceiling, roughly this height, they had two eight-foot fans on top, extracting air, full speed. And it's like, what the hell? What do you do, guys, with this? And they're like, oh, well, you know, we needed it. Why? Because we had a welding station here. Yeah, well, there's no welding station now. Oh, yeah, yeah, we moved it three years ago to the different plant. They never turned it off. They shut those fans off. They saved all, almost half a million cubic meters of natural gas in their case. Those are huge fans. They suck. You stood underneath, you felt those fans in 34-foot ceilings. I mean, that happens. You just, you have to go and do the capacity. I have installed probably nine, ten million dollars worth of capital projects in my previous lives. I can tell you that never once I looked at the exhaust or the makeup air requirements once we changed the whole line out. It's just that there was no time. And I didn't know about the program that we offer, right? So, there was nothing that we've done. That's what we're trying to avoid now. So, everybody wants to hear good stories, so let's hear a couple of the good stories. These are actual examples that we'll go through now of real customers that we dealt with in the last three to four years. Um, they're picked for a couple of reasons. Impact, of course, but it's also ones that we worked hardest to change their mind at. So it's not just the size of the project that matters here, it's also how hard we had to work to get them to change their mind. Um, so in all cases, they achieved financial benefits, of course, they lowered their cost structure. They maintained good indoor air quality. None of the, these uh, cases we ever uh, made indoor air quality worse, perceived or real and we increased employee, employee comfort in all cases. So let's go to the example number one. We had welding cells, a bunch of welding cells in the, in the facility, and they had localized exhaust already on top of them, 86,000 CFM worth of localized exhaust on top of the welding cells, and they had makeup air of about 72,000 CFM. 
Notice how these numbers are fairly similar. So when it was designed originally, that's what it, how it was designed. They had a little bit of negative air so that to ensure that no fumes can actually spread through the facility. They pulled out the exhaust right at the source. They did all the good things. Except over time they added 360,000 CFM of general roof exhaust. This is the building, this is the facility that has welding cells in one half and the other half is um, stamping. They had 100,000 CFM of exhaust in the stamping part of the facility. And we asked why. I can understand the welding cells, but why do you have the stamping? Oh, it's terrible, terrible. Nobody wants to work there unless the exhaust's on. Then we went and we actually talked to people on the floor why they need exhaust. Because we were there at the, in the shoulder months, so it didn't feel like particularly bad. And one guy told me, he goes, it's terrible here. You should be here in August or July. Hold on a second. So you're saying it's hot here? Oh yeah, it's terrible. This is, you can't live in the summer. Well, what about the winter? Oh, winter is pretty comfortable here. But it's kind of drafty. Okay? So we went back with that information. We talked to the customer, re reviewed some of the stuff. <coughs> customer told us, this is, when you get through the map, this is infiltration area that they had. 374,000 CFM of cold air going into the facility. in low ambient temperatures. In the, sum, in the winter, they can actually get below 10 degrees Celsius there. And then the uh, plant manager told us in the subsequent meeting that they had a walkout last win winter previous to the last one because it was too cold and people complained and walked out of the job. So when we started talking to them, they originally contacted us because they wanted to put makeup air. And they said, can we get incentive for the more efficient makeup air? That's how we, the, the debate started. So yes, true, they would reduce the infiltration air. They would make their space more comfortable. This is all true. But it will also cost them 750,000 cubic meters a year in natural gas to heat that air. They would almost triple their current consumption if they went down this road. So we said, we have another solution for you guys. Why don't we turn off some of the general exhaust in the winter times only to 169,000? Notice it's not to zero. Small steps, which will reduce your infiltration air, which will create the same comfort level as if you added the makeup air. First meeting after that was like, man, we're not sure. Second meeting after that, oh, okay, this is not bad. Let's do it. Third meeting after that, we came up with the idea. We will now not only do this because we have to invest money in control systems, we will actually hook up our process exhaust and not use it on the weekends when we don't actually have welding in the facility. So all of that, cost them $62,000 to do. Savings, avoided use of natural gas is 750,000. Avoided use of electricity and reduced hours, 835,000 kilowatt hours for the payback of 0.2 years. They're very happy customers. And then we gave him $31,000 in incentive. And the facility is the same comfort level as it would be if they added 128,000 CFM of makeup air. <coughs> there was no impact to indoor air quality. There's no complaints by the employees of any of them. So pretty good example. Big, good example. Small examples, exhaust volume, welding station. They already had localized extraction above the uh, welding stations. <coughs> then we interlocked makeup air unit that was serving that area to the exhaust volume to ensure that exhaust, when exhaust doesn't run, makeup air doesn't run. And then 
with a programmable thermostat, simple programmable thermostat to actually stop the unit when the brakes are on. So if the guy leaves for an hour and there's no welding, the exhaust stops for an hour, make a pair stops for an hour. Yeah, yeah. put a little tag on it. <laughs> the savings would be a whole lot higher. So the lesson in this is the controlling the time the exhausts run. Same volume of exhaust, but control the time makes control, um, controls the makeup air cost and controls your cost. So this is the example. Small investment, three and a half thousand dollar total. Small savings. Look, two hours per day for 120 days. These are the savings. You pay back in a year for only two hours a day. Small incentive, small investment, right? However, still a very good project to do. You saved only two hours a day for 120 days. I mean, and you still saved enough to pay back the programmable thermostat. Third example. This one is a, in some way similar to the first, but far more complex setup. So we had number of production lines. I'm showing here two, but it's in effect there was a five production lines in this facility. I just ran out of the power slide, PowerPoint slide space. So they had localized exhaust above their lines. They are, um, what they do is they melt plastic and they put it onto their product. So they had that exhaust removed. They had make up air units, seven of them but it was operating based on the hard settings inside the unit. So they didn't have a central thermostat. They had a thermostat inside the unit and said, I want this unit to constantly give me 70 degrees F. And then they had general exhaust in addition to these exhausts, and that was about two thirds of their overall exhaust volume. It was about 100 different units that were all part of this system. And what led to this project is Analysis of, you will hear, you will see here, average temperature in Toronto, cons their consumption total, their seasonal load out of that consumption, and their weekend consumption. And what you will see, their weekend consumption was very high, 24% of their overall load. 29% of the time of the year is actually weekend which told me that when I looked at this data originally, it told me that they must run their units all the time. So we went, met with them. No, absolutely no. We turn all our units off when we're not here. So you run 24-7. No, we run 24-5. Actually, 16-5. Yeah, but, you know, this data shows different. No, no, we turn them all off. Okay. With a follow-up meeting, same thing. No, no, absolutely, turn them all off. They brought maintenance manager in. No, we turn them all off. So the um, production manager actually got interested in this and went in on Saturday afternoon because he was living close to the facility. So he went in on Saturday afternoon. Guess what he found? All of the units were running. Full out. Zero people in the facility. He actually unlocked his own way into the facility. So when he realized that, then we started actually talking back about the project that went on. So potential was clearly there, 363,000 cubic meters of saving. And then when we did analysis of the electricity, we'll also see how much electricity was saved. What we ended up doing, because of the setup of this system, we, had, we created zones. So every production line had its own zonal controller with its own inputs and outputs. So we had five of them in the end. All of them fed micro, microprocessor-based facility-wide controller that went into historian and the PC-based user interface. But we also had the line out to the internet connection. So if, for example, zonal controller was running outside of the regular schedule, email would go out to the plant manager and to key people on their Blackberry and say, something's running and it's not supposed to, what do you want to do? So that's how the system was set up. So every single of those 100 units was controlled by this microprocessor-based system. This is what the people in the plant saw, the people who were in charge of this system. They had an interface, they had heating, ventilation, and then they added lighting as well. 
so they can control the lights in the facility based on the production schedule. So each one of these was actually, you can see here, spring fall schedule running, summer schedule running, so they can, heating units and the ventilation units could be run at the different schedules depending what you want to achieve. And then on top of that, they were also controlled based on the production schedule. So you could say in this one, I want heating only five days a week, only 16 hours, and then for the remaining time, I want heating at 20% less temperature, for example. And that was programmed. And because we were very cautious, this is unionized plant, very cautious, we did indoor air quality before, and we did indoor air quality after. And also, every operator had the opportunity to actually override these settings. For example, if maintenance were working on that day, they needed heating higher than what it was said, they could override the settings. Key part was you can override the settings only for two hours at a time. When two hours expired, the system would go back to the default mode. So if you're still there, you had to go back and reset it again. So that's how they were running. So we tied them to individual production lines. Then we tied makeup air to the exhaust, excuse me. And then we tied a certain amount of exhaust to the makeup air volume. Because these were direct fired units, we wanted to ensure that we always exhaust about 100% of makeup air volume. So each makeup air had been locked in with another set of exhausts around it to exhaust that amount. That way we controlled both time and the volume of the makeup air. And then the rest of the exhaust was turned off all on based on the schedule. In the summertime, they were all on. In the shoulder months, half of them were on. In the wintertime, they were all off. Only the, pro only the process exhaust was running. And only when the production was running on that line. So because the general exhaust was two-thirds of the overall exhaust, we turned it off. That saved 365,000 CFM of exhaust volume during the heating season. But this is the real meat of the story. If you draw the consumption in cubic meters per month versus the outdoor temperature over the period of time from 2008 to 2012, the project was done, you will see when. This is their consumption in red bars. You can clearly see winter of 2011 being lower than winters before, even though the temperature was actually dipping lower than the ones before. The next year, similar savings. So they actually, because they're part of the large multinational corporation, they wanted to confirm, because they, they invested money into this, so they wanted to make sure that what they report back to corporate was accurate. Because as probably many of you know, you tell corporate I save $100,000, your budget for next year is $100,000 less. Good job, by the way. <laughs> so, to make sure that they didn't overstate the savings because then they would be in a negative next year, they measured it over the course of the year. So these are the numbers that they came up with. They actually saved 360,000 cubic meters of gas. They saved million kilowatt hours of electricity. They had 500 horsepower worth of exhaust fans alone in that facility. Just turning that off makes huge savings. I mean, simple as that. They invested $140,000 in that whole system, so that included audits, uh, indoor air, um, air balance audit, indoor air quality audit. It included design and installation of the system. It included design and installation of that user interface, and they all done with their usual contractors. They didn't go anywhere else. They just told their contractor, this is what we want, this is how it should work. They got it done. So $140,000 for $170,000 savings. Simple payback, 0.8 years. This is what they reported to corporate. These are the real numbers. We gave them almost $30,000 in incentive. And before you ask, I don't know if they ask, electricity guys. <laughs> this was in 2010, 2009. I don't know how good they were at that time. So again, real example of below one year payback. So if this is something that we can help you identify and say, hey, you have potential to save $170,000, do you really think that $2,000 audit should stop that project? I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer, right? 
So how can we actually reduce exhaust? We talked about it, but physically, what can we do? Simplest way you can do, you can just go up on the roof and put the lock on the exhaust and lock it out and not be able to turn it back on. Like that's simplest. They've done this in that example that I talked about where they distributed heat from injection molding. And what happened is they changed the personnel. That plant manager left. The next plant manager didn't know where to turn on the exhaust on. For a month, they were cooking in that facility because they forgot to turn back on the exhaust. So yes, it's cheap, it's effective, but you're not sure that the savings will pers persist because you don't know if somebody's going to turn it back on. Or it's dependent on people to remember every season to turn it back on and off. So it's a good measure. It's as good as any other measure uh, savings-wise, but persistence and relying on people is not the best way to save money. So what will happen is we believe, we personally believe, that adding the simplest control, that can be sort of like some sort of um, switch or something that goes to central place where somebody in charge can actually say, hey, they're on or off and they're not supposed to be. It can be as simple as that. Big red light. Um, we believe that that will actually contribute to the persistency of the savings, and it will get you closer to relying less on people, which is never a good thing. So we believe so much in this that we actually, for the limited time, which you've seen that in your brochures, we offer um, limited time offer. We will pay 100% of the cost, not usual 50% of the cost, but 100% of the cost of the purchase and installation of the centralized control system for your facility if it's implemented between now and the end of the year. For all of this, when we talk about how much exhausted energy you have, how much energy you have in makeup air, all of those need some accurate assumptions, just like any other formula. Garbage in, garbage out. So we try to be as accurate as possible. And sometimes that means you need to know the temperature differential, equipment efficiencies, building air balance, and airflow. So we are pretty efficient with equipment knowledge. We know how much roughly you're going to run at percentage, what, what kind of efficiency you're going to get. So that's not a big deal. But temperature differential, building air balance and airflow, that's very important. So we want to know how much uh, makeup air you have and how much exhaust you have. And keep in mind that most people will just look at their nameplate, which is not always good enough. You can have 40, I've seen personally 40,000 CFN makeup air units with the dirty filters having 31,000 CFM of air actually getting into the building. You're 25% off on your estimate of air just by doing that. And we would never know that unless we actually measured it. So to measure it, you really need an air balance assessment. That's the best way to know what's going on in your building. And I wouldn't say, if you've done one couple of years ago, I wouldn't say that it needs to be done again. I would just say, let's take a look if anything has changed first. But if you have never done one, it's a very good thing to have. Not necessarily because you're going to do a project right now, which would be nice, but also because you will know if your, for example, makeup air goes, or if your exhaust needs replacing, or you need something else, you will go back and say, now I have some information before I'm in emergency mode and I need to just replace the damn unit. Now I have something to actually analyze and know what is going on. So we always re recommend these air balance. We've done, we supported many over the period of years, and we've never had one where um, almost nothing has happened after. We always had some sort of result as, at, at the end of it. Sometimes it took a couple of years to get there, but always result. Before we go into air balance, there will be many people who will sell you air balance assessments. We actually, our ESCs can give you a scope of work that air balance, good air balance must contain. I would highly encourage you to ask ESC to give you that part because I have seen very large air balances done with just reading the nameplates for many thousands of dollars. Well, if all you're going to do is read the nameplate, get the summer student to read the nameplate for you. That's not good enough. So you actually have to measure the airflow, both volume and temperature of any inlet and outlet of the air. You have to check for indoor air movement. Sometimes you have to do the smoke test to see that the actual facility, how the air flows through the facility. You have to account for seasonal variation. So if somebody comes and measures the summer conditions, say in, you do air balance in July, they have to be 
knowledgeable enough to ask people in the plant, is this how you run it in the winter time? Because I don't want you to go and do the project, plan the project. You go all through the planning stages, you get everything, and then somebody tells you, yeah, but we already turned this off in the winter time anyway, so I don't know what the hell you're doing. So we want you to avoid that. And good air balance assessment will actually find that for you. And of course, they will take note of the condition of existing equipment. They will say your filters are dirty or you have lots of debris or something like that. They won't physically touch the equipment. They're not HVAC specialists, but they will tell you what, what to look for. So that's a minimum that good air balance study has to do. And this is the next step. It's expensive. Many customers have told me this. I don't want to do air balance studies. It's expensive. I don't want anything to do with it. We don't have money for it. OK? First of all, it's not expensive. It's properly scoped and executed. Secondly, we can help you put the proper scope together so you don't waste time and money and effort onto something that you don't really need to get out of the study. Thirdly, and most importantly, we will give you up to 50% of the cost of that air balance study as part of our regular program. But this is really important. It pays for itself. I'm not sure why this came out that way. But it pays for itself if you are doing or are planning on doing any of the changes to your heating system or building envelope. Because many times people will say air balance is just like an audit. Audit doesn't have a payback. Well, this one does. Air curtains. How many of you have installed air curtains? Anybody? Yeah, yeah. Lots of people put them on to prevent the air infiltration going from the shipping doors inside the building. What is air curtain? Air curtain is just this highly concentrated stream of air that fan above the door concentrates indoor air and shoots it down in front of the door to reduce the amount of infiltration. Very good idea for people who have balanced buildings because This is only airstream here. So you have one airstream fighting the other airstream. And if this is balanced, this is very small. So air curtain, great. But if this air filt infiltration is huge, it will actually overpower this. And that's why you have different effectiveness of the air curtains in, in their materials. They'll actually tell you that 70% or so based on the properly balanced building. If your building has large negative or positive pressure, your effectiveness of air curtains drops off, and the payback you were hoping to get with it actually gets reduced. If you've done air balance study, you would know that. If you haven't, you would, you would overpay, essentially, for the air curtain. Dog seals, another popular thing to do. Many people have dog, seal, uh, dog doors. They put dog seals. Very good idea to put. So let's say this facility. Um, this particular facility that I'm thinking of has four doors, but again, I just put three there. They had, none of them had dog, dog seals. They put on two of them because they didn't have money to put on the other two. So the gentleman came on our, one of our previous uh, uh, workshops this year and said what happened to him is they eliminated air infiltration in the two areas, but they increased air infiltration on the other two. Because as long as you suck the air out of the building, air has to come in from somewhere. And if you closed off these two paths, in this case, and air can get in through there, a lot more air will come through here. Because our buildings are not airtight. You will not prevent air from coming in if you overexhaust them. Physically, it's impossible. So air infiltration volume remains simpler. All you're going to do is make it really fast. Infrared heater door, very popular measure. We already talked about it. You put infrared heater. We all know how it looks. But what does infrared heater actually do? Does anybody know how it works? Right. It takes the radiant heat and does not heat the air. It heats the floor. It heats the walls. It heats the objects around you. So the guy who's standing around that, it's very warm. But it does nothing for the air 
that just goes past it through the shipping door underneath that heater onto the exhaust area. So if you put this to, to prevent cold air inside your facility, you wasted the money. And you wouldn't know that unless you paid for the air balance study. So air balance pays for itself if it's done really well. And again, just because we're good people, for the limited time, we'll cover 100% of the cost of the air balance assessment. Because we really believe this is something that drives behavior. Knowing knowledge, just like in anything else. If you know what you're going to do, you're not going to do bad things. People do wrong things not because they want to do them, but because they don't know any better. They don't have information. Information is expensive. So in summary, lowering negative pressure does not endanger health and safety. I want to get that out of the way. If there is any hint of potentially endangering health and safety, do an indoor air quality. None of us want to hurt anybody. That's not the point of this. So, but in most cases, actual reduction in exhaust will improve employee comfort. We already seen how. The lower exhaust levels result in the lower infiltration. If you have less infiltration coming from outside, the ratio between a tempered air that you put through the facility from the makeup air units versus the infiltrated air is better, which means it's warmer and there is less draft in the building. Simple as that. So what this does, lowering negative pressure will result in lower energy costs, both electricity and gas. So it's not just one stream of energy. All energy will be saved. Because lower air volumes, less fans need to work, so they save electricity, and less heat is needed to temper that amount of air. And all leads to the better margins, and that's what we are here for. I don't want you to think of energy just because of energy. Energy is part of your margin structure. Energy is part of your comfort. Energy is part of your quality. That's what we want you to think of. Because ultimately, energy is the same as the raw material. You control your raw material for to nth degree. You know exactly how much raw material you use. But very few of you will know exactly how much energy you spend in that process that you know raw material usage for. And it's just as important part of the equation. That concludes the presentation. Thank you for coming again. Any questions, feel free to ask. If you want to ask questions after, I'm here. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.